Our human ancestors spent the last two million years primarily in a state of ketosis. With this first statement, I'm sure I have already caused a lot of raised eyebrows within the first few seconds of this video. But that is not the point of this video. The point of this video really is to try and find the actual diet of our ancestors over the past two million years and what kind of metabolism that would have caused them to have. This is due to the fact that what the general scientific community has clearly shown is an obvious and direct bias that ignores clear and obvious facts in the nutritional guidelines they have given over the past 50 years. The logic used in the food pyramid created in the 1970s and then the promotion of plant foods over animal derived foods in the past 20 years baffles me. The logic used in these lines of thinking almost completely ignores our evolution over several million years and what our true ancestral diet was. We are told repeatedly to attain our vitamins and minerals from plant sources while we hardly absorb nutrients from them in their natural state. We are recommended to reduce saturated fat as much as possible while our ancestors used it as their primary fuel source for millions of years. We are told that carbohydrates should form the bulk of our diets while our ancestors ate very little of them and only occasionally. But humans have been eating carbohydrates for a very long time, haven't they? To this question I reply back with what carbohydrates were they eating exactly? Because from everything we understand about the world before the agricultural revolution is that there were hardly any carbohydrates available for a human in the Paleolithic era. A common answer is tubers or starchy roots of some kind. Well, which tubers in that case? Because potatoes did not exist outside of South America until the age of discovery. During the several ice ages we endured, we supposedly were digging through snow to find some sort of high-carb magical tuber which doesn't grow anywhere today, which we have suddenly stopped eating for some reason. They hardly exist, even today. Wheat? Wheat did not exist until the agricultural revolution. Grass seeds then. Good luck trying to scratch out a living as a nomadic hunter gathering grass seeds which had a tiny fraction of the nutrients our modern day wheat has whilst herds of animals roam around you tempting your spear. The fact is, carbohydrates are a scarce resource in the wild even today after we have line bred thousands of plants to become filled with them through our transition into farming. Before the agricultural revolution, we had a very limited access to carbohydrates and therefore humans had to eat what was available to them, animals and low carb plants. The next time you go for a hike, try this experiment. Try to identify as many edible plants as you can. And of those plants, try to research the carbohydrate values of them. You'll find negligible amounts. Yes, we did eat plants, despite our hyper carnivorous nature. We know this from analyzing the guts of prehistoric humans, such as Otzi the Iceman. As we see from his case, his final meal was ibex and deer meat, but he also snacked on fern fronds, berries, and some grains. Yes, Otzi did eat some grains, but it's important to note that he lived at a time, although being hunter-gatherers, his people had begun to transition into farming, as he lived quite recently around 5,000 years ago. He even sported a flashy copper knife, showing how near to our times he lived. Fruits, as we see them today, didn't exist for the most part, and basically all of the vegetables we enjoy today were line bred to become what they are, so we didn't eat those either. In fact, the pyramids are older than broccoli, tomatoes, oranges, cucumbers, and almost everything else you'd buy at the supermarket. As these things clearly didn't exist on earth, there was no way we could have been eating them. And their ancestors were fibrous, nutritionally poor, and minuscule. So surviving on those would have been near impossible too. Living during the multiple ice ages we endured, 
made the few low-sugar, low-carb fruits and nuts that did exist a rare find, and they were only seasonal. Long winters and frigid temperatures removed our ability to become vegetarians in most parts of the world. A winter during a glacial period was brutal, and our ancestors would have had little choice other than the fatty parts of animals to fuel their bodies. A pine forest offers very little in the form of carbohydrates, and if your ancestors come from outside of Africa, it's likely they spent the majority of the past 100,000 years evolving in this sort of biome. And if you'd like to find out more about your ancestors and where they come from, allow me to introduce our sponsor for today, Talmigen. Wondering how much Neanderthal DNA you have? Talmigen has generously decided to give my viewers a 10% discount on their DNA tests. This is one of the few DNA tests that shows the amount of Neanderthal DNA you have. Being one of the most comprehensive DNA tests out there, they also offer tons of super interesting info relating to your genetic code and can tell you about your paternal and maternal haplogroups, as well as health, pharmacological and nutritional information unique to your DNA. Click the link below and use my coupon Archives of ECNI to get your 10% discount. Anyway, without further ado, let's get back to the video. An interesting view taken by a large part of the scientific community is that we predominantly ate lean meats. I find this view absurd. This line of thinking follows our modern habits of mostly only eating the muscle tissues of animals, which our ancestors were smart enough not to do. The amount of fat available throughout a large herbivore is immense, and there are high concentrations of this fat in the organs, marrow, and of course, the subcutaneous fat the animals had. Eating this way was a necessity for survival, and we see predators today favoring them over muscle tissue, as these foods contain crucial nutrients found in lesser amounts in the muscles. The calories we needed as hunter-gatherers really were only in one place, fats, and more specifically animal fats. Why else would we have risked facing such intimidating animals 20 times our size with nothing but a spear? We had no other choice. It's clear from just analyzing the landscape our ancestors came from that there wasn't enough calories to subside off of in any other place other than animals. A major argument brought up by people against the facts presented is that modern-day hunter-gatherer tribes diets include carbohydrates from their biome. The Hadza are a favorite tribe among the school of thought as they consume higher amounts of plants than other modern-day hunter-gatherer tribes and so conveniently they are spoken about the most. The leader of this tribe of hunter-gatherers What's the most important thing in life? Manako. In, Manako. Yeah. in fact, using modern-day hunter-gatherers doesn't make much sense, as they live in a time where most of their natural prey has been wiped out, and they are forced to subside off of an alternative diet. 20,000 years and prior, megafauna roamed the world as giant sources of food, and even the prey we still see today were found in exponentially higher numbers. In addition, they live in a world filled with man-made crops strung out among the wild that didn't exist before agriculture. If your ancestors are from outside of Africa, they undoubtedly lived in a completely different biome, which was far colder with less plant foods and honey available for the majority of the last 100,000 years due to the ice ages. Regardless, let's humor the critics and take a look at the total calories they derive from animal versus plant sources and why. From this graph, we can see that most of the hunter-gatherers in these tribes derive the majority of their calories from protein and fats. This number is around the 75% mark for most of them, and regardless of the total weight of the plants they eat, most of their energy is still within the keto diet range. Honey is consumed, there is no doubt about that, but an incredibly active lifestyle undoubtedly burns off much of this glucose stored in the liver quite quickly. The Hudza derive around half of their calories from protein and fat, despite them being an anomaly and definitely out of the ordinary for hunter-gatherers, eating far more calories from plants than other groups. 
The majority of these hunter-gatherer groups derived most of their calories from fat and protein. The carbs they do eat usually have a very high fiber content, which negates much of the carbohydrates they do contain. And the absorption of those carbohydrates is far less than the nutrition they absorb from animal-derived foods. On that note, the bioavailability of food matters more than almost anything. After all, a food can contain all the nutrition in the world, but it doesn't matter if our bodies are unable to absorb and then use those nutrients. Spinach is high in iron, isn't it? But due to the bioavailability of this food, which is around 10 times less, you'd need to eat 40 kilograms of spinach to satisfy your iron requirements. In fact, all plant foods follow this trend, and when it comes to the nutrition contents of unprocessed vegetables, we could say that most of the vitamins and minerals in them end up being useless. Surely humans evolved to digest them better, seen as though they are what we are meant to be eating, according to the general scientific community. So we can logically assume humans hunted animals as a primary source of food, and we were living off of this diet supplemented by small amounts of low-carb plants. If we understand this, we can logically assume that these humans were in ketosis most of the time, interrupted by brief pauses when the tribe got lucky and scored a honey snack or perhaps 8 kilograms of berries over a few days. This ketosis was further pushed by the periods of fasting during an extremely active lifestyle pursuing prey, waiting for the next successful hunt to deliver them the next meal of meat and fat. As we know, not eating or eating very little over a few days puts our bodies into the state of ketosis and this undoubtedly happened very often for our prehistoric ancestors. We can safely assume that since the time of Homo erectus we were consistently living off of this meat-centric diet until the advent of agriculture which happened for most populations around a mere four or five thousand years ago. Homo erectus began persistent hunting two million years ago and every human species we evolved into from this point forward kept hunting until very recently. The modern human body is still the ultimate persistent hunting machine. We can run longer than any other animal on the planet. We lost our hair and evolved sweating to be better at cooling during midday hunts, and an averagely fit adult could run down and catch a horse, deer, or whatever animal they wanted to. How could we ever believe that our entire morphology being designed around this central thing was per chance. After all, those root tubers and berries require tons of running, don't they? In fact, most animals are in a state of ketosis too. Even many of the vegetarian animals we preyed upon are in a state of ketosis, such as many of the grass-eating animals, not digesting the grass they eat, and instead eating the bacteria living within their gut, feeding off of that grass. These bacteria produce short, chain fatty acids, which are then absorbed by the cow slash gorilla. Now try to imagine 2 million years of humans being in a state of ketosis suddenly coming to a halt. A new adaptive challenge which brought with it a host of problems. Humans were now constantly filling their bodies with carbohydrates as fuel, when this had never occurred before. Could this be the reason that our average lifespan dropped to the lowest it ever has during the agricultural revolution? at a staggering 20 years old, despite us now living in villages with bigger communities with a lot more shelter from the elements and wild animals. It's very likely. Our skeletons and brains shrunk dramatically after our switch to our high-carb diet, and humans began to suffer from a host of ailments previously unseen in fossil records. I made a previous video about this going into more details of this process our ancestors went through as agriculture began, if you'd like to check it out after this one. Carbohydrates are stored in the body's liver and muscles, and there is only so much storage space. Once our body reaches capacity, it begins to convert these carbs into fat. The liver is the primary store of carbohydrates in the form of glycogen in the body. In modern diets high in carbs, the liver is often continuously full to the brim with energy with these energy stores continuously being topped up again and again endlessly. This wouldn't happen if the energy within the liver was expended, or carbs weren't eaten for a period, allowing it to empty regularly 
and clear all of this energy, switching back to the body's other fuel source, fat. Years upon years of being at max capacity, the liver starts to become fatty and the body's ability to control sugar begins to suffer. Insulin resistance ensues and prediabetes is the most likely situation the body finds itself in. One in three Americans is pre-diabetic as it stands currently. And before anyone makes assumptions, you don't need to be overweight to find yourself in the situation. One in three Americans of normal weight are pre-diabetic. The liver can become fatty in a person of normal weight quite easily with a modern diet. Once the liver becomes fatty, it sets off a chain reaction in the body. Metabolic disease can be defined as the dysfunction of the human body's ability to deal with blood sugar and, as we've already established, is usually the result of the overconsumption of carbohydrates throughout the person's life, especially if the energy in the liver is not being burnt through exercise. If we were designed to subside off of a carb-heavy diet, why is it that almost half of the world's population has metabolic syndrome? Cancer, diabetes, brain disease, and heart disease are far and above the highest causes of mortality in modern humans. And unsurprisingly, these are all closely linked to metabolic dysfunction. Around 60% of human mortality can be attributed to these diseases in the year 2019. Could it be that our unnatural diets are the primary reasons our lives end? The series of events follows this. Carbs are overeaten throughout the modern human's life. The liver is chronically at capacity for years on end. Insulin resistance, fatty liver, metabolic disease follow. Metabolic disease damages and weakens the body. The body succumbs to damage and falls victim to a serious chronic disease. The chronic disease is treated through medicine and overconsumption of carbs is almost never considered. Have we really lost our way this much? Our bodies were designed to handle carbohydrates occasionally and in relatively low amounts. The lucky find of some berries and nuts were welcomed by our ancestors with open arms, undoubtedly. But these were found only around a few months of the year. We live in a time of chronic carbohydrate consumption, where modern humans eat incredible amounts of carbs multiple times a day. Could we really be disregarding this factor in modern day medicine? Perhaps our default setting of cycling in and out of ketosis periodically, but spending most of the time in the state, would lead to a massive reduction in many of the health problems we face today.